Take up the black man's burden. Send forth the words ye breed. And bind our sons in shackles to serve your selfish greed. To wait in heavy harness, be deviled and beguiled, until the fates remove you from a world you have defiled. Take up the black man's burden. Your lies may still abide to veil the threat of terror and check our racial pride. Your cannon, church, and courthouse may still our sons constrain to seek the white man's profit and work the white man's gain. Take up the black man's burden, reach out and hog the earth, and leave your workers hungry in the country of their birth. Then when your goal is nearest, the end for which you fought, watch Tenton, trained efficiency, bring all your hope for naught. Take up the black man's burden, reduce their chiefs and kings, to toil of surf and sweeper, the lot of common things. Sodden their soil with slaughter, ravish their lands with lead. Go sign them with your living and seal them with your dead. Take up the black man's burden and keep your old reward. The course of those ye cozen, the hate of those ye barred. From your Canadian cities and your Australian ports, and when they ask for meat and drink, go girdle them with forts. Take up the black man's burden, ye cannot stoop to less. Will not your fraud of freedom still cloak your greediness? But by the gods ye worship, and by the deeds ye do, the silent, sullen people shall weigh your gods and you. Take up the black man's burden until the tale is told, until the balances of hate bear down the beam of gold. And while ye wait, remember that justice, though delayed, will hold you as her debtor till the black man's debt is paid. Welcome to Straight Up. You've heard from Brett Johnson, a Brooklyn Community Access producer who has a show called Mosaic Live, doing a reading from the Hubert Harrison Reader. My guest today is the, uh, the author of the Hubert Harrison Reader, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Perry. Uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Jeffrey Perry. Thank you. Now, the piece that uh, Brett read was uh, a, called The Black Man's Burden, mm -hmm. and it was a reply to Rudyard K Kipling's The White Man's Burden. Right. Tell us about uh, Hubert Harrison. Who was this uh, man? Um, Hubert Harrison uh, was lived 44 years. He was born in 1883 in St. Croix, which is in the Danish West Indies, and he lived until 1927 when he died uh, unexpectedly from, uh, 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 when he died unexpectedly <laughs> from appendicitis. Uh, he was a brilliant writer, orator, educator, critic, and radical political activist, and Harrison is one of the most important yet neglected figures of early 20th century mm -hmm. America. Um, to just recount what some of his contemporaries said about him, the historian Joel A. Rogers, who's very famous for his uh, many times reprinted World's Great Men of Color, describes Harrison as the foremost Afro-American intellect of his time and one of America's greatest minds. Rogers adds, after very insightful chapters on Booker T. Washington, William Monroe Trotter, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Marcus Garvey, that no one worked more seriously and indefatigably to enlighten his fellow men than Hubert Harrison, and none of the Afro-American leaders of his time had a saner and more effective program. Uh, Rogers wasn't the only one who spoke, who spoke so glowingly of Harrison. The novelist Henry Miller, a socialist in his youth, considered Harrison at his idol and said that he was an unrivaled, electrifying speaker who had the ability to demolish any opponent. William Pickens, the field secretary of the NAACP, a former college dean and an oratory prize winner himself at Yale, described Harrison as a plain black man who can speak more easily, effectively, and interestingly on a greater variety of subjects than any other man I've met in the great universities. Pickens added that Harrison was a walking encyclopedia of current human facts, especially history and literature, and it made no difference whether he spoke of Alice in Wonderland, H.G. Wells, Edgar Allan Poe, 
Immanuel Kant, music, art, science, or political history. Harrison was truly a brilliant man, and um, he, but he was more than that because he was very rooted in the community. Hodge, Hodge Kiernan, Montserrat born, who was a leading Harlem activist in the 1920s, emphasized that Harrison lived with and amongst his people, not on the fringes of their social life. And actually, he did. He lived on 134th Street in the same apartment for the last 20 years of his life. He taught the masses and drew much of his inspiration from them, and he was the first Negro, according to Kiernan, whose radicalism was comprehensive, comprehensive enough to cr include racialism, politics, theological criticism, sociology, and education in a thoroughgoing and scientific manner. Just two other quotes, just from his contemporary, right. so you get a feel. W.A. Domingo, the first editor of Marcus Garvey's Negro World, underscored the fact that Garvey, a. Philip Randolph and all the leading black activists of his generation followed Hubert Harrison. And Eugene O'Neill, who was America's leading playwright in the 1920s and a future Nobel Prize winner for literature, lauded Harrison's ability as a critic and considered Harrison's review of the groundbreaking play The Emperor Jones to be one of the very few intelligent criticisms of the piece that he had seen. And he assured Harrison that he would have a place as a critic in any theater with which he was connected. Despite his high praise from such high praise from his contemporaries, Harrison is largely unknown today. He has been greatly neglected, and there is great loss in this for all of us. Um, just to focus on what he did in his life that is of most importance, I think, is he made his mark by struggling against both class and racial oppression and by participating in and helping to create a very vibrant intellectual life for the common people in the communities where he lived and functioned. He emphasized in all his work the need for working class people to be class conscious, for African Americans to be race conscious, and for all people to develop a modern, critical approach to how they live their lives. Okay. Now, yeah. you've, sa you've said a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, uh, now, is there anything more you want us to say? Because we're going to hit on uh, a lot of the points that yeah, you Yeah, ju just two, two last things. One is that as a social activist, Harrison is unique because of all the activists of the early 20th century, he is the only one to play vitally important roles in the largest class radical movement, socialism, and the largest race radical movement, what was called the New Negro Movement. It was the equivalent of the Black Power Movement of the 60s, okay. the New Negro slash Garvey Movement. He was prominent leader in both of those movements, and uh, he's unique in that, in that sense. And the last thing is Harrison is a tremendous literary talent. I've been working on his papers, and I will get into this, but for about 18 years, and there's about seven or 800 pieces I've been okay. able to put together. So yeah. why, why did you uh, decide to write about Harrison? Briefly, um, in the early uh, 1980s, I came across two of his books on microfilm up at the Schomburg Center in, in, on 135th Street. I w it was in the course of some research I was doing analyzing why efforts at social change in the United States in the 20th century had failed, primarily focusing on the role of racism in undermining those efforts, and also on the role of the fight against racism as energizing uh, those efforts. Uh, I myself grew up in the 60s and 70s when the civil rights, black liberation struggle not only were great heroic struggles in their own right, but energized the women's movement, the anti-war movement, and many of the other movements. So I was looking at things from that perspective, and I came across these two books by Harrison on microfilm. His first book, uh, The Negro and the Nation, written in 1917, and his second book, When Africa Work, uh, Awakes, written in 1920. And I was essentially, I was just arrested by the clarity of his thought. He was, to my, to my mind, the clearest thinker on questions of race and class of that whole generation. I had never seen anyone write so consistently with such clarity on these issues. Now, the, um, the Hubert Harrison Reader is mm -hmm. a collection of his writings. And he's written over uh, 600 uh, different writings. And in the Hubert Harrison Reader, you have a, Two hundred, uh, one hundred and thirty-eight. Uh, one hundred and thirty-eight right. writings, selections. Yeah. selections. How did you uh, decide out of all those writings? How did you make that decision? Well, it was difficult because uh, one thing that's been noted, and now as the reviews are starting to come in, all the, the reviewers are noticing Harrison is a brilliant writer. He's, he's uh, has a way with words. He was also a brilliant orator. I mean, a unique combination because oftentimes people aren't exceptional at both. He was exceptional at both, and. Um, so it was difficult. What I tried to do is make the reader comprehensive enough 
to deal with different aspects of uh, of his writing. So I would I tried to have a little section on how he developed his own approach to solving problems. That's his early his world view. I talk about uh, his class radical period, his race radical period. His he was a great internationalist. Uh, wrote far more knowledgeably about the rest of the world than almost any of his contemporaries, be it India or China, Africa, the Caribbean, the Soviet, it wasn't, well, it was the Soviet Union after the 19, uh, 1922. So do you place him up there with Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and uh, Marcus Garvey? Well, I certainly think Harrison ranks up there, but I'm not the only one. J.A. Rogers in The World's Great Men of Color, as I opened with that quote, and he was a contemporary of all those and very familiar with their works. He did, and I think, I expect over the next few years as people come to know uh, Harrison's writings more in his life mm -hmm. that he is going to attract very much attention. Uh, he really is a brilliant writer, and he, he offers a lot in different areas that some of the other mentioned people right. don't. Right? Well, um, my hope is that we will get some more readings by Brett Johnson uh, during the program. Yeah. But let's start from his beginnings. Okay. He was born in St. Croix. Mm -hmm. How long was he in St. Croix before he came to the United right. States? And what was it like for him then? Sure. Harrison lived his first 17 years on St. Croix, which is a small island of when he was there. It was a Danish possession, Danish West Indies at the time. And it uh, had a population between 20 and 30,000 and an economy that centered on sugar production and related rum production. Um, there were several things as I researched Harrison because it was hard finding information. I made several trips to St. Croix and to Denmark even to try and track down records. But it was hard piecing together very much. But there were a few factors in the history of St. Croix, which as a historian, as I approached writing Harrison's biography, I also have a two-volume biography coming out on Harrison, uh, several factors in St. Croix's history that I think had great bearing and impact on Harrison's, and they very briefly are that the island has a very rich tradition of direct action struggle. What do you mean by direct action? Direct action is when the people angered enough over current conditions, take action themselves to um, change things. And Harrison was a big proponent of this. He was a big proponent of having people act when, when conditions were so oppressive. And in St. Croix, the instances that come to mind, and they're very, they were very much a part of the oral tradition that he grew up with as a youth, at least the first two, mm -hmm. where there was an 1848 slave-led emancipation victory. So it's, uh, I think, the second earliest in the Americas. Um, and that was in 1848. A fellow named Boudot was considered the leader, but it was sl overall it was a slave-led emancipation victory. And the second big struggle was in 1878 when women of the island, led by Queen Mary Thomas, Queen Agnes, and Queen Matilda, led a major labor, island-wide labor protest called the Great Fire Burn, which really renegotiated labor conditions on the island. The third incident was in 1916 after Harrison left, but by, it was by his schoolmate and close friend for his whole life, mm -hmm. a fellow named D. Hamilton Jackson, who's known as the Black Moses of uh, St. Croix. And that was a general strike which essentially forced Denmark to give up mm -hmm. um, the islands and the U.S. was able to move in. That wasn't the only factor, but that was one of the factors. So in St. Croix, there's this history of direct action. T uh, one other thing that's very important and important to understand uh, what he does here in the U.S. and it it's, uh, is the way the color line was drawn in St. Croix, and it's different than uh, what he came to know here. And he's not the only one who comment, commented on this. Other uh, early Caribbean immigrants, Garvey, Claude McKay in particular comes to mind, but m many of them commented on how the organized racism in the United States was much more virulent and aggressive and unlike what they were familiar with back home. In Harrison's case in St. Croix, there was no lynching. There was no segregation. There was no formal discrimination. These things, and and in general, because because of racial particulars and a whole history of how struggle developed in in Saint Croix and in the Caribbean, as opposed to in the U.S., particularly in the Southern U.S., right. the es essence of the difference in many respects. I don't mean to simplify this right. too much, but one of the big differences was. In St. Croix, there was some policy of promotion for a sector of the African-American population to kind of maintain social control. 